Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we have a very special topic to discuss. It's the rage of the country, the false rage, I must add, critical race theory. Well, today, known as the ethics sage to many, with a reputation as an expert in ethics, Dr. Steve Mintz is a professor emeritus from Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo. He received an accountant exemplar award from the public interest section of the American Accounting Association in 2015. His blog, Ethics Sage, was recognized as number 49 out of 100 top philosophy blogs and one of the top 30 blogs on corporate social responsibility. Steve shares insights into business ethics through his workplace ethics advice blog and special take on ethics in colleges and universities in a blog, Higher Ed Ethics Watch, that begins next month. It's a pleasure to have you on. Dr. Mintz, how are you doing today? Fine. Thank you for having me. Well, I mean, uh, you, you, you kind of made a statement in, in that thing there that, that, um, what, what that talked about the social responsibility of corporations against Ms. Milton Friedman will not be happy with you. Yeah. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> anyhow, let... I can't worry about Milton. <laughs> well, I, I just thought I might bring him up because you know his his great essays in the early yes. earlier part of the twentieth century. What he had to say about the social responsibilities of corporations. Anyhow, we are here to talk about critical race theory. First of all, how do you define critical race theory? Well, it's it's uh, basically a theory that says um, there's racism in American society, it's inbred. Um, it pretty much colors everything that goes on. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a way of teaching mm -hmm. about American history and racism, discrimination, a little bit of slavery as well over a number of years. So it's part of the school's curriculum. And I think that's the controversial issue from my point of view, whether it should be or it shouldn't be. Now, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think we can't deny our past. Uh, there's a lot of discrimination that's occurred over the years, still exists. There's no question about it. I think we still have some of the same challenges we've had for quite a long time. Uh, the underfunding of schools in black and minority communities comes to mind. Still some discrimination in housing, obviously, uh, you have to have your eyes shut to not realize there is with criminal justice, given what's happened in the last two or three years, we just had the decision in the George Floyd case. So, you know, I think the issue boils down to is America a racist country or is it just that it has racist policies that rear its ugly head from time to time? I think that's where the debate seems to come down. And where do you land in that debate? Uh, I'd be honest with you, I'm probably somewhere in between. I recognize that there still is racism. There still are people who are against uh, Blacks and other minorities, quite frankly, simply because of the color of their skin. But on the other hand, I do recognize having been a product of the 1960s, there's been a lot of progress not quickly enough, no doubt about it. And we need to move more quickly, especially given our past history. The last two years have been very troubling, I think, for all Americans with the number of Blacks shot in the street with no reason. And we have to come to grips with this, start a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue between all sides. And unfortunately, I don't see that happening right now. I just see a divisive country. Now, the right has uh, suddenly come up with the, the meme, the, the CRT meme, the critical race theory meme. Uh, was there some staunch change in what was being taught from K to 12 and as well as in advanced academia? Was there any major shift or change that necessitated some concern about uh, we are going through a new paradigm in which CRT is being taught and in which uh, it, it, is, it is designed to make uh, white people feel less than good people? 
I think it's always been taught in colleges and universities. It's nothing new in that regard. The question is whether it should be taught in K through 12. That's where the controversy arises. Should kid, children that young uh, be taught that America is a racist country? And some say no. Why, you know, why make them feel badly about American history at that young age? They're very impressionable. Others say yes, it's part of our history and it should be taught. But I think in the current environment, as you pointed out at the beginning of the interview, um, the rage of the country is some parent groups getting very upset about the fact that it's now part of the curriculum or proposed to be part of the curriculum of K through 12. We had the incident in uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, where parents got very, very vocal at a school board meeting because they want to make it part of the curriculum. And that's happening more and more in schools. So I think that's the change, the teaching of CRT earlier when um, children are younger than we have done in the past. Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna get more specific on that. In the, if we take a look at how often this is mentioned on TV in mostly right-wing media, et cetera, um, was there really some major change in, high, in K through 12 curricula that actually said, we are going to start teaching CRT in these schools? I, I am, even in, in Virginia, it seemed to me like it wasn't CRT that was being taught, just true history, right? I mean, in which there, well, it's different. I think CRT has to do with the systemic nature of racism in the country and how it infiltrates from, uh, from our criminal justice system to our economic system, et cetera. While I believe in, in K through 12, we're just learning the different facets of, of, of our country's history. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I think you're right. And I think those who do not want CRT taught in K through 12 say, at least some of them do, some of them may deny that it should be taught at all, that yeah, let's teach it as part of American history. It's one element, but it's not important enough to have a major module, a major segment on American history. That's what the uh, those who don't want it taught say pretty much. Although there are some that don't want it taught at all, even as part of American history, they'd like it to be erased from the consciousness of young people because they argue things have changed sufficiently to do that. I don't agree with that, but I think that's the argument. I think it does have to be taught. Call it what you will. Call it critical race theory. Call it systemic discrimination. It has to be taught. And I think the sooner the better. The problem is if you don't teach it in K through 12, these kids come to college and they're not sensitized to what's been going on it makes it more difficult as a college professor for many years when youngsters come to our college and they haven't been exposed to the basics, whether it's mathematics or economics or whatever, it makes it more difficult to teach it in college because they're taught something different or it's been ignored in their early education. And what college is supposed to do is build on a foundation of what's taught in the earlier years. So that's my problem with it. We can't just uh, you know, wash it away as if it didn't exist, especially with all the challenges we've had in the last few years. It makes it imperative even more so that it be taught. Now, his, the idea behind history many times is to ensure as well that we don't repeat the, the past mistakes that we've made. And uh, my, my concern is here that is that we don't have enough people speaking up to that effect. And that if we don't, if, if our kids believe the fallacy that we were magnanimous in our formation, that somehow, uh, you know, the, the, first of all, they don't understand why, why certain communities are in the state that they're in. Example is, uh, the, the, the minuscule growth, let's see, in communities of color, the non-existent growth, let's see, in native communities are generally based on the lack of investment that had occurred through this country's inception. I mean, and that was all based on who these people were. I mean, uh, if people don't know the truth, they would actually, they can actually be co-opting to believe in 
that there's something genetically wrong with these other people, why they are the ones who are underperformers, as opposed to knowing that it's externalities that cause that. Your thought on that? No, I agree with that. I agree with what you have said. Um, the impression that sometimes left is it's the minorities who have created their own problem. Right. They haven't right. gotten together. They haven't uh, advanced enough, whether it's educationally or what have you, rather than looking at the systems. And I agree with you, there's not been enough investment in those areas. Uh, the underfunding of schools is a tragedy. And nothing, look, we've been talking about this since the 60s. So we are talking about 50, 60 years. It seems as though we just kick the ball down the road, you know, kick the can down the road. Nothing happens. A lot of talk about it. But for whatever reason, there has been no significant change in the issues that face Black and minority communities. And it's, you know, possibly getting worse. I am a little hopeful that the change of presidential administrations will make some progress the last four years under President Trump obviously have been very troubling in that regard. And we have to uh, recover, so to speak, from that. And it is important that social programs be putting at the front. We put at the front of our priorities, not something we talk about and never do anything about, because that's the future of this country, especially with more minority groups. Uh, immigrants and others coming into the country. We should be a welcoming country, but we should also provide the resources, the education, the social services, political fairness in our system to make that happen. So we, we want people to come here just as the immigrants came, uh, you know, 200 and so years ago. And um, it, we, we have to do this on multi-levels and I don't see it happening. Economically, there has to be more investment in black and minority communities. Um, call it what you will, uh, economic development zones. It, it needs to be done. It, and the key is it needs to be a priority. We have so much wealth in this country. Question is, how are we spending it? Now, my theory is that the vast majority of people are good. And that when the vast majority of people, when informed, uh, they don't necessarily uh, take on, you know, personally speaking, I don't want, uh, I, I don't think anyone needs to feel guilt uh, of what their ancestors did. I think they have to be cognizant of the benefits that they have, in, that they have engendered from what their ancestors did and also be willing going forward to mitigate for those issues that have occurred. That's my thought. And I think decent people actually think that way. My theory is, however, that there is a class in this uh, country. And I think this, this particular class is a pathological class that actually believes that uh, if we were all to get together, if we were all to see things as they really are and become and, and, and allowed our human side to come out, that the divisions, that the uh, the the disparities that occur uh, would cause that small class in power its power. I think it is more than, I don't, I think it has a lot to do with the economics of the few. And I've always wanted to have somebody that, that writes like you do. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. And it, it is something that we have to do something about systemically and I don't know if people should fear the results of that. I don't myself. And I do believe what you said about most people are good people, but we have to have the leaders. I always contend that right. when I talk about business ethics, you mentioned it earlier, social responsibility. We talk about the tone at the top, the ethical tone at the top. And if the leaders aren't ethical, if they don't set a good role example, role model, it doesn't really help people to develop in their thought process. And that's what we're facing in Congress all too, much, too often, I believe. The other point I'd like to make, you made an interesting point. I visited Germany a lot and I've talked to Germans. We used to have exchange programs in another university. They're quite open and above board and honest about their Nazi past. They recognize it. They almost want to celebrate it 
So their youngsters don't forget about it. There were all sorts of monuments to uh, Jews and other groups that were in, got involved in the Holocaust. And uh, we seem to want to sweep it under the rug, whereas they want to discuss it openly. And I think it's a great model, the German model. Look how much they've developed over the years. And they're very sensitive uh, people to that today. They're sensitive to minority groups. They were welcoming to the immigrants uh, back when that became quite common from the Middle East and so on. Yeah, well, I, like, I, like I said, uh, doctor, I really think it has to do, believe it or not, everything in, in America, my thoughts are, it has to do with green. And the, the idea that we won't be able to control people by having them be pitted against each other, as opposed to looking to where a lot of our problems are, I think may be partially the issue. Now we're uh, running up on some time here. So what I'd like to ask you is, I, and it's the last question I always ask, what should I have asked you that I didn't? What would you like to tell our audience that, that to get out there right now? Well, in my own writings and blogs that you mentioned, I like to link the teaching of critical race theory to the cancel culture. Because if, if you come out against the critical right, uh, race theory, then you could be canceled by the community, uh, ostracized from your community. And we have to realize this is all part of one problem. I put everything under the umbrella of the cancel culture, whether it's critical race theory, um, pro political correctness, uh, the thought police, and I could probably go on, wokeism, it all comes under the cancel culture. So in my mind, we have to deal with the bigger problem of the cancel culture. And whether this is good or this is bad and uh, how it will affect America in the future. So I try to do that in my blogs to make people aware of the links and all of these theories. So that would be the main thing I'd like to add to our discussion. Well, Dr. Steve Mintz, thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. I think you brought a whole lot of enlightenment. And I think you're right. It's important for us to uh, take, a, take a look at the cancel culture and how it actually affects dialogue, how it also affects the ability. The, the, I, act, I believe people have to have the ability to fail, to be wrong, and then be enlightened and not have to worry about uh, being canceled, if you will, because again, that shuts down discourse, in my humble opinion. Uh, even though that was your last question, I want your thought on that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We have to have open dialogue, free speech. And I agree with you on that thought. Yeah, I mean, I know in my own life, I've made mistakes. Um, and I would hate to be defined by my worst act. I mean, who among us haven't made mistakes? The key is whether I admit my mistakes. I show true remorse and I try to reform myself based on dialogue and civility, which has gone in society as well. To me, that is the key rather than canceling somebody because 20, 30 years ago, they may have said something um, stupid, ill-informed, what, is they, what have they done in their life for the last 20, 30 years? And what is the content of their character? That's what it all comes down to for me. Dr. Steve Mintz, PhD, Professor Discussing Ethics, CRT. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics Done Right. Thank you for having me. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.